welcome to our review on chromatography. So when we're thinking about chromatography, the first thing we really need to know is what on earth are we talking about? So if you break the word down, chroma just means colour and the graphy bit is referring to a graph. So basically it's giving us a colour graph. So this is a way of actually separating out chemicals into an easy to interpret system. Now, chromatography is going to rely on two chemical phases. The first one, the stationary phase, as the name suggests, is the one that doesn't move. And then the mobile phase, again, quite an obvious name there, it's the one that moves. So what we're going to find is that depending on the type of chromatography, the stationary phase and the mobile phase will be different things. But we're going to look at them in turn so you understand which is stationary and which is mobile. So the kind of chromatography that you've almost certainly done in school at some point in your lives is paper chromatography. So in paper chromatography, then what we find is the stationary phase is the paper and the mobile phase is the solvent, which in all likelihood was probably water in your case. And you probably did this with bits of felt tip pens and then watched them travel up the piece of paper. A slightly more upper class version of this is thin layer chromatography. Now, thin layer chromatography, you're less likely to done in school because the plates are pretty expensive. But what we actually have is the stationary phase is a thin layer of silica or alumina powder, which is spread over this sheet of plastic or glass. So you get this real fine powder coating, which is attached onto the plastic or the glass there. We still have our mobile phase, which is the solvent. And again, that solvent could be a variety of things depending on what we're actually trying to separate out. So the way we do this is the same, whether we're talking thin layer or whether we are talking paper, we follow the same steps. So the first thing we're going to do is put our solvent into our tank, which if we're looking at schools, it was a good old beaker. And that's only to a depth of about a centimetre. We then mark our baseline in pencil on our plate or our piece of paper. And the reason we use pencil is because it doesn't run with the solvents. If you use something like a pen, the pen link will run with different solvents. You place a small spot of your sample on the baseline and then you put the plate into the tank, making sure that your sample is above the solvent line. You then leave it and watch until that solvent line reaches near the top of the plate, but you take it out before the solvent has actually hit the top of the plate. So the next thing we actually need to understand is how we can use these actual plates that we've now generated. It's all good and fine having a bunch of spots on a bit of paper or a bit of a plate, but we need to actually interpret those. In the simplest way, we can actually pat match so that if you have spots in the same place, then they will be the same substance. But the more complex way is to calculate something called the RF value. So we need to know how to do this. So you need to learn this equation here. So the RF value is the distance traveled by the substance divided by the distance traveled by the solvent. So if you have a look at the little picture in the bottom there, we've got two spots, okay? The green spot A, which is eight centimeters, and the blue spot B, which has traveled three centimeters. In order to work out the distance traveled by the solvent, you measure from the baseline to the solvent front. So basically the little marker where the solvent got to. Then all we do is you're gonna measure from the baseline to the center of your particular spot and then divide that value by how far the solvent moved. And that gives you your RF value. Now RF values don't have units. It's purely a number that varies from zero to one. So the last type of chromatography we need to know about is gas chromatography. Now, what we find here, we still have our stationary and our mobile phases. The stationary phase is silica or alumina powder, which is packed into a metal column, which you can see in the middle of the diagram on the right there. The mobile phase is an unreactive carrier gas, which could very well be nitrogen. And the reason that we use that is that it doesn't react with any of the actual sample we're trying to test. So if you look at the diagram on the right, you can see we've got our carrier gas cylinder on the left hand side of it. You've got your little sample injection point. Then you've got the column packed with the particles of our stationary phase, which will be the silica or alumina powder. And then it passes up through the detector, which is connected onto a computer. And that's where we're going to see our end result of the chromatogram being produced.
So in terms of how gas chromatography works then, is when you inject the sample, it's turned into a gas. Now that carrier gas that we've got in our cylinder pushes our sample through the column. And what we find is that depending on which components are present, they're gonna take different times to travel through the stationary phase. And that all depends on how strongly they bond to the stationary phase. As they come through, then the detector is going to obviously detect them as the name suggests, and it sends a signal to the computer as each component then passes through that region. And that's what you then see on the computer screen as the chromatogram is a series of little peaks that tell you when a sample has come through and also the relative amounts of that sample as well. Hopefully at the end of this video, you now know all the different types of chromatography that we use and the basics of how they work. You do need to be able to identify both the stationary phase and the mobile phase in each one. So make sure you can do that for paper, thin layer and gas chromatography. And you also need to be able to calculate the RF values.